What's up everybody, it's Soren Baker here on Unique Access, and today we're joined by Legendary Traxter. Thank you for coming through, sir. No problem, what up, y'all? Yes, yes, so Trax, man, it's a, you, as always, have a lot of great things going on, and I uh, just know that recently you just signed a, a, a new deal with the, the relaunch of Priority Records. Yeah. So uh, how did that come about, and explain what that is? Um, well, Priority um, relaunched, they're, they're, they're doing some new things over there, they have a great team, and uh, I was in contact with some some of the people who are involved, um, the the uh, ANRs are people that I had relationships when I stayed in Atlanta a few years back. Right, right. So everybody's familiar with my history and everything and uh, everything I've done. And when uh, the opportunity presented itself, uh, they offered it to me, and I thought it was a great idea. Okay. So uh, I know no IDs over there. Fuzzy West is over there. So with uh, No ID in particular, I know that you've had an extensive relationship also being from Chicago, but then have uh, co-produced and done a lot of different things with him over the years. So what do you think makes you and No ID like a good team and partnership? Well, you know, I'm a little funny acting when it comes to who I produce with, right? So um, I have to, I only produce, co-produce with people who, you know, I feel like bring something to the table that I don't necessarily I'm not the expert in. Right? Okay. My collaborations we go all the way back to the D to the S days. K Tone yes. was one of the few people that I would actually produce beats with. So um, but it's an important element. It's this. <clears throat> you have to I have to work with somebody who understands that a system and where it's comfortable and a person um, if they feel strongly enough about a certain element um, they'll express that and then I'll compromise and if I feel strongly about an element they'll compromise. Okay. So that's the type of relationship that I have with, with No ID. It's very um, supplementary or complementary okay. in, in, in those senses and that's why um, every venture that we've been involved with has been successful from um, No ID versus Tracks, the website <laughs> which yeah. was the start to um, uh, we did uh, I do it for Big Sean and uh, a record for Twister and Raekwon <clears throat> and you know we just uh, have a great relationship because you know we're really the two pillars of Chicago hip hop right. um, when you when you really look at it you know and um, we didn't we didn't mess with each other <laughs> back right, then right, right. but you know after going through the years and growing we found uh, great friends in each other in each other so that's why that relationship continues to blossom. And then what are you going to be doing with the new priority situation? Well, of course, um, I had, well, I'm going to be a little cryptic in this because my competition is watching and they can't wait to uh, steal my ideas. But <laughs> um, Tia London has a, a project coming out, um, which is going to be incredible. Uh, I did a, a record last year called Black Saints. Mm -hmm. So the follow up to that is called Slay the Father. Um, and that's something I'm going to do a priority. And then I'm also have a, a bunch of, you know, I say uh, I'm the new Master P, you know what I'm saying? Okay. So on the priority side, so, you know, I have some great ideas to work with some new artists and some some of my favorite artists um, on projects. Okay. <clears throat> and um, I don't want to tip anybody off, but the new artists will be brand new artists, like dope MCs that nobody's ever heard before. And the uh, other projects that I'm working on are gonna be just people that I wanna work with. This, this, this deal and this situation gives me, as a producer, a great opportunity to <clears throat> work with artists that I uh, admire or wanna, just wanna work with on my own terms. You okay. know what I'm saying? Well, that's good. And I think that that's been, uh, you know, obviously working with you and knowing you for a long time, that's been one of the hallmarks of how you operate. And I think that that's been, one of the reasons why you've been successful. So with that being said, as you kind of look back, especially in the foundational years of when you broke through with Do or Die and with Twister, what do you realize from um, the music standpoint and then also from the business standpoint that you did that was different either in Chicago or rap in general that helped you, you know, catapult yourself into, you know, being super successful? Well, I'm gonna share this information on your sh on this show, um, so you might want to put a little indentation right there. This is super important right here. <laughs> but I, I figured that out. I spent uh, about 
four, three weeks ago, I figured it out. I okay. figured out what happened. Okay. Because, you know, for 20 years, I've been trying to figure out what made me different from anybody else. So here's the reason. <clears throat> People who know know that I produced uh, an album for Twister prior to uh, Adrenaline Rush, which was called The Resurrection. And it's a hip-hop album. It's what he did and it's what I did with D-Taz and my hip-hop uh, uh Origins in and Chicago. With tongue twister. And him with tongue twister. Running off at the mouth. So you would say, okay, well, what happened in between that that got to Adrenaline Rush? Because there was no lead up to Adrenaline Rush from me and him. You right. know, it, was a, it was a do or die project. But what it was, we figured out how to. I, I worked with do or die and I figured out a formula. And it even goes back before do or die, I worked with Psychodrama. And I figured out a formula. And then he and I were smart enough to transpose what we had just then did in Resurrection into the new format. And that's how you get Adrenaline Rush. Okay. Because if you listen to Adrenaline Rush, it's a street record, but all the metaphors in it are a micro gun. If you, it's, a, it's the, the comparison between lyricism and, and uh, being in the, in streets. the streets. You right. know what I'm saying? So um, the whole album really follows that metaphoric theme for him because he was transitioning from a pure lyricist into I'm not gonna say a street rapper, but I'm gonna say, you know, a more reality, uh, rap rapping more about reality. Mm -hmm. So, when it comes to me, what I figured out and what made me different was, I figured out that you have to innovate. And the innovating, the innovating moment was Psychodrama Do or Die and no, you know, Pope Pimp. Mm -hmm. I'll say Pope Pimp because that was the hit, right? Right. So, um, when looking back at my career, that's the thing that um, changed everything for me. Figuring out a new way to present those same skills. Looking back, what things do you draw inspiration from to know that you, that is possible, but without saying I'm gonna copy it? Well, one of the biggest realizations I've made in my studies over the last month was how little music was in hip hop when I mm. fell in love with it, right? So, I watched this evolution, and again, you probably should put a little <laughs> denotation right here because it's some very important information for that. Um, hip hop started with two turntables and records, break beats, DJ right. going back and forth, right? So hip hop's foundation, you know, the, the musical part of that record, we considered the whack part, right? And the drum break was what everybody wanted to, wanted to break dance to. That's why they call break dancers because they were dancing to the drum right. break. Right. Okay, so. Um, hip hop sound was drum live drums off records, right? Break beats. Then the next evolution was, oh well, we don't we want to make our own records. Drum machines came in, right? So 808s, um, Lin drums, different drum machines came into hip hop. Um, After then, the brief flirtation with live, but yes. Yeah, with the exactly. <laughs> After the see, I, I don't count. <laughs> I kind of skip the disco thing. Yeah, okay, right? okay. I shouldn't, but I do. Brief flirtation. Um, so, then what happened was tech, and, and this is what the thing with innovation is. Technology got innovation. Mm. So the next thing that happened is you had sampling drum machines where people could sample drums from those records so that they could have that sound that everybody yearned from the break beats, but program them like drum machines. Right? right, so that was the next inc uh, incarnation of it. So as I studied this and I learned those different variations, it made me say, yeah, as a kid, all I cared about was the drums. You know what I'm saying? But now music has, um, oh, hip hop has merged with R&B. That's a fact that nobody wants to admit. Hip hop and R&B are the same genre now. There's no <laughs> separation. If you say, what, who's the new R&B artist? It's the artists that are singing through auto tune because Trey Songs and all of those type of artists are uh, '90s R&B artists essentially in right. style. So if you say what's the evolution of R&B, it's you know rap. Uh, it was used, people used to say all rappers wanted to be singers and all singers wanted to be rappers. Well, it's happened now. It's a real thing now, right? <laughs> so um, what I say that to say that um, when it comes to uh, what I want to do next is I, now that I've discovered that hip hop can exist and lyrics shine and different things happen when there's less music 
and 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 hip hop has become so musical that the drums these aren't even the the They're main not the driving force driving force anymore. Yeah. So that's something that I want to do is revisit um, making records that are. Oh, I'm drawing inspiration from records who are um, based on rhythmic elements opposed to melodic elements, right? Um, there's enough room for melodic elements in the voices, and that's the other difference. Is like um, it, you'd be a surprise at how much singing rappers was doing in the beginning. You in know the seventies, all the harmonizing, <laughs> Cold Crush, exactly. Treacherous Three, etc. So there's a lot of those elements that have vanished from hip hop. So when I draw inspiration, I just look at the history of it and say what's missing and how can I reincorporate that. Now, don't get me wrong, I love. Uh, some of the new elements in hip hop right now. Um, there's a certain energy, you know. I see the dances, I see the thing. You got to embrace that in order to continue to love hip hop. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, when I did the wetter record with Twister, ten years later after Get It Wet, Get it wet and mm -hmm. uh, Adrenaline Rush, there were kids, 15, 14, um, uh, 16 year old. 16 year olds that had never heard Adrenaline Rush. So to them, that was innovative. That was a whole new sound to them. Mm -hmm. and then I watched how many artists did remixes, and then I watched how uh, the next couple of years a lot of singles had that vibe to it. And I understood that, you know, sometimes you can bring something back and it'll appear to be new. Yeah. So I draw a lot of inspiration from um, the history of hip hop and. Um, Re relearning with a with a more conscious mind what it was that I loved about it in the beginning. So when we talk about BDP, why did why was BDP the record the art the group that resonated with me the most? It was because them drums was knocking so hard. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying that you know what I'm saying I fell in love with that. And as a as a producer, you know even like when I look at me and No ID. Um, a lot of times uh, I would tell him, man, I just really want to hear you chop samples over dope drum drums. It's that simple for what I like from him. So it's that simple about what people like from me. Twister tell me all the time, man, I, you know, it's just when I used to come to your studio, man, it was just like other people, he told me this not too long ago, other people would tap a drum and it'd be like, boom, cat. And when you would trap a, tap a drum and it'd be like, Boom, boom, you know what I'm saying? Like he thought, he, in his mind, everything I did had this percussive right. uh, 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 size to it. So um, I think that goes back to hip hop. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I draw from. That's what I'm drawing from, from currently. Cool, man. Well, we appreciate you coming through. Tracks, always a pleasure. I'm Soren Baker, legendary tractors in the building. Unique access, y'all. Thank you. Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip-hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.